Hello and welcome to part two of the bifolding window shutters build. In part one, we made the frame that sits in the window opening. That's a painted tulip frame. And part two here, we're gonna be looking at building the door. So as I mentioned before, I've got a couple of old pine doors. One of them's quite twisted and they're both a slightly odd size. So I'm gonna be harvesting the timber from them doors to make the new bifolding shutters for this new window opening. Right, so to get started, the old doors on the bench, I was just setting out the height that the finished shutters will be and cutting off the top and bottom rail right through the door. So I'm harvesting basically the pieces of timber at the top and the bottom of the door here. The panel saw also gives me a lovely clean square cut through the door. So now the doors are cut down, I'm just setting out from the centre of the middle rail the height of the shutters so that the middle rail and the finished shutters ends up in the middle. And then I've checked the timber thicknesses for the top and the bottom rails and I've done the appropriate sizes in from them marks and used a square cut board working from the inside of the door styles to square over my shoulder line on them bunting rails. Once I've got that line, just testing out my newly fixed Carvex jigsaw, see how square it cuts by cutting that shoulder line, seeing how it performs. It seemed to do pretty well. To remove this piece of timber, you had to remove the nails from the panel beads. So the best way to do that is with a little multi-tool with a bi-metal saw blade. Then I used a guide block to cut the beadings back at 45 degrees, just slightly longer than I needed them, and then I could pair them back with a chisel later on for a perfect fit. Now I'm just marking the panels for the amount that it needs to protrude into the bottom and top rail grooves, and cut them off with the multi-tool. Then cleaning up the joint on the existing rails of glue residue and making sure that they fit in the new panel groove location. There we go. Once the dry fit looks good, I do the same thing with the other end, so the bottom rail, and again do a dry fit to make sure everything fits. Then I glued the door together using the PU glue. This is the cartridge type PU glue and I find it the best. I apply a thin bead and then just spread it out with a filler knife. Make sure that the doors are clamped well through the muntins, then turn the door over and clamp it across the rails, making sure it's nice and tight while the glue goes off. The joy of using PU glue is that it only takes a couple of minutes. Once dry, I put the door onto the panel saw and cut it in half to give me my two shutter sizes. I'm a little bit concerned at this point because the bond between the muntin and the middle rail, which was existing on the door, isn't actually very strong and it fell apart as I pulled the off cut from the door. Right, so I don't think this is going to work because it's just left the, the piece here too thin it just doesn't look right so i think what i'm going to do is use the off cuts from the door styles and just trim these rails down and i can just get a little bit thicker panel there and it'll just reduce the panel width slightly which will work in our favor and uh, give us a an upright all the way through the piece so it should look more correct and make it a nice sort of strong door rather than having it all loose through here. blow the dust off the old wobble saw. I've not used it in about 10 years. 
So it used to, used to be our only form of grooving where it used to work. But you, it's basically a saw blade on a set of tapered cams and as you turn the saw blade against the cam it just how it sits on like the angle and it'll do a, a, a wider or a narrower groove depending on where it sits on how much it wobbles. So I used the wobble saw for this job because this timber's quite likely to have nails or foreign objects in it and I didn't want to risk damaging my expensive adjustable groover. The wobble saw is quite old, I don't really use it anymore and it's already got a couple of chipped teeth so I wasn't too fussed if I were to hit a nail and it wouldn't ruin my day. I'm stopping the grooves away from the ends of the styles so that you don't see the groove run through the end of them. And this gives a nice flat surface for the domino to seat into so you get a stronger joint. I'm using a 10x50 domino in the DF500 and just putting one in each rail to attach the styles to the rails. So there we go, that looks a bit more proper. I'm going to skip forward now and will join me when I've got these glued up and I'll cut them to size. Right, so I've now got four shutters, two narrower ones with a slightly narrower panel and narrower styles that will make up the smaller door and then two wider ones with slightly wider styles. I can just cut them up now really accurately on the panel saw, get them nice and straight, the right size and cut them all off nice and square so that I can start working on the hinges and the guides for the sliding track. I'm loving the panel saw, it makes fitting doors really easy with perfectly straight and square cuts every time. You can just set your measurement, cut it and then pretty much guaranteed a perfect fit as long as your measurements are correct. I genuinely think for fitting doors like this it's better than a horizontal sort of normal panel saw because you've got the door sat on that reference edge that keeps it parallel to the cut that you're making. As well as not having to manhandle and push a, a door horizontally past the blade, I think it genuinely is a better option for door fitting. I'm pleased to get to this stage. When I glued that first door up and the muntins and the rails still ran through the middle, it just didn't look right. It's a fair bit of work to put new styles on all the panels and cut the panels down and stuff, but it's going to end up a much better job and it actually looks correct now, so the, the styles would run right through the shutters, so it does look good. And I think worth the time, it's just when you get to that stage in the project and then realise you've got a load more work to do to do what's right, it's just a bit depressing. I do find that if I'm really into the job, I work harder, quicker and more enthusiastically than if I've fallen out of love with the project I'm working on, it can become a bit of a grind. So now that I've got over that hurdle, I feel like I really want to crack on with this and do a good job of it. So a good stage to be at for motivation. Right, so next stages are going to involve chopping some hinges in. So I'm going to let the hinges in on the doors, like the first one, so the narrower shutter. I'm going to put the first hinge in to hinge it onto the frame. They then want hinging together as a pair of shutters and that little keep that slides within the brass track needs letting into the end of the door. So that can all be done. I'll just do everything with a single screw in the hinges because I have to make any adjustments and I've still got a couple of holes to make that adjustment within the hinge. Right then with the hinges it plays quite an important role at how you chop the hinge into the frame and the doors. The amount of protrusion above the shutter to the frame joint where we've got the first hinge, the more protrusion I have on the hinge away from the door, the more it's going to throw this door away from the track when it opens up at 90 degrees. So if I open that hinge up there, if you imagine that door's in the open position there, the deeper that I chop the hinge into the door when it's open, the closer it's going to end up into the 
opening of the shutters so it effectively reduces the gap from the track to the first door so offset that really deep so the first hinge is going to be basically pivoting about the center of the knuckle so the edge of the door is the center of the knuckle i've mopped the hinge up here just to show what i mean so this will be in effect the door and then on the frame we're going to have a housing that looks something like that so this is the inside face where the, the front of the shutters will be flush to and they open away backwards and the hinge will sit in a socket like that. So in effect we end up with a joint that looks like this when it's open. So one thing I have noticed from doing this mock-up is I'm going to have to change that slightly because the beading on these shutters sticks out ever so slightly in places. So like here, there's, a, there's about four mil of protrusion on this beading around the panel from the face of the shutter. So if I put that, install it in this manner here, where we've got like a two mil gap between the frame and the shutter, when I open the shutter, the beading that sits on this in outer edge is actually going to foul on the frame. So I've got to set this hinge up so it brings this shutter just a couple, I'm going to give it a couple more mil than I have done off this frame when it's open, which is going to set this hinge a couple mil more further in this direction when it's in the closed position to maintain the correct alignment in this face. There we go, that's uh, given me just a couple of mil when it's open of leeway so that those beads should clear the frame. It just means I'll have to chop this hinge into the frame ever so slightly further out which might slightly affect how the doors swing back and where the, the pin position of that second door is within the track but I'm not going to drill that pin position until I've got both doors hung and can sit them in a 90 degree position and mark the centre of the track so that's the very last job. So moving on to letting the hinges in I'm using one of my homemade router jigs I did a video on these which is well worth a look so go and check that out if you haven't already I'll put a link in the description The corner chisel that Trent sent me is also finding a regular use in my workshop. I'll put a link in the description box again, along with one for the self-centering hinge drills. I like these because they go directly in the Centratech chuck and it makes it really compact to use. Okay, so that's all the hinge housings cut. Do, 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 do. little top tip if like there one of the hinges doesn't quite slip, slot into place if you just slacken all the hinges by two mil on the screw just gives everything a tiny bit of wiggle room so you can wiggle the door get all the hinges in in every location and then tighten them up you shouldn't have to reach for the chisel and chop your housing any bigger Looks 
when I straighten the two doors out, it is the lines that I mark off the edge of the door. Exactly the same for both of them. If I take one off each shorter door, it will help me with this little bit here. So when I set the door at 90 degrees, if I take a mill off the shorter door, it'll bring this door back this way. Another mill. That's going to help me when I drill this hole in the end of here for this guide pin. It'll just give me one, one more millimetre of material to help support it, so to keep it nice and strong. So I'll take them to bits, take one mil off the length of the short doors, chop the hinges in again, another mil deeper, and then should be about right. There we go, I think we've got about the right gap now. So there's about, I'd say two and a half mil in the middle, which just allows the doors to pivot because they, they get a bit closer as you pivot that. It obviously lengthens because of the offset of the hinge knuckles lengthens the door so I need a little bit of gap in the middle to allow them to open without pushing the other door open or, or, or rubbing on the other door so that's about perfect I can fiddle about with the gaps once we're on site so that's absolutely fine just going to quickly get one of the pins drilled in so I'm going to push that to one side set it so it sits square I'm just going to mark the centre of the track so it's going to be a 9mm drill bit followed by an 18 so I've got a bit of clearance for that that knuckle to sit into so then I'll drill it almost so it sits free floating in that position so there's not a lot of spring pressure downhill so I'll drill that one quite deep then drill a counter bore that will allow this part to push up into the door and they can be removed fairly easily. See if I can split this door open. On a job. Oh my days, that, that is beautiful. I've got both the tracks in now, I've got all the pins in their doors, it's looking pretty good, works lovely. The hinges are a little bit stiff in the knuckles so they just need to work in so that they loosen up a little bit. But it works really nicely. What I need to do is add in like a door stop at the top and that's so that when the shutters are in the closed position like this I can add in some magnets on this side and that will basically allow me to to lock the shutters or, or magnetize them shut so if there's a bit of a overpressure in a room from opening a door or a draft comes through they're not all the while just going to sort of pop open and sit like that because that would be pretty annoying. So I'm going to sink in some rare earth magnets into the face here so they act on the face against a stop that's got the same magnets in. So that's why I've set the doors 10mm back from this frame. So I'm actually going to cut this frame section down by 10mm and then make a say like a 40mm by 10 section on here that will effectively create a rebate at the top of the lining and then I can just sink their magnets in sort of 5mm depth that the, the magnets need to sit in and they should act together so that then when they're in the open position they should also magnetise together in that position so 
if I set my magnets right, so there's going to be a bit of checking going on as I set them, but I'm going to set them so that these two magnetise to each other, but then the magnets opposite magnetise to them as well. So it sort of works as a, as a pull force in both the open and the closed position. Right, the magnet position I've marked here. So in order to recess out, you could just drill it in from the face, drill it in and glue that magnet in place. I'm using these rare earth magnets, 12 by 6 in an N52, so they're nice and strong. But what I'm going to do to keep it sort of unseen is from that centre mark, mark the radius of the magnet. And I'll route her in from the top of the door downhill. So I've got a little trend, I think it's a 5mm diameter router bit came in this set of cutters. Now, Trendar helped me with the videos, but I bought this before they had anything to do with the videos, so this isn't a paid promotion at all. But it's one of the narrow cutters here. It's actually a really good little set. I think it's only about 25 quid or something like that, so well worth having one if you've got a quarter inch router. But yeah, this is the five mil diameter cutter. And it just works lovely for plunging in to cut this magnet hole. So this is the side at which the magnet wants to be set into to work against the door stop. So what I've done is set the fence up on the router from the opposite side of the door because I'm going to set this cutter really close to the edge. I want like a, a one and a half, two mil timber maximum between the magnet and the outside of the door. So I'm going to set that cutter right on the edge there. And because I sent, set the fence on the back side of the door, there's no chance whatsoever that that cutter can go through and cut out the face of the door, which would be disastrous. That's why I'm working from that edge. All I've done is set the plunge depth to the depth of the magnet. So 12 mil plus a, a couple of mil to have it just slightly away from this top surface. And then I'll just plunge in. Because it's a 5mm cutter and they're 6mm magnets, I just have to offset that a tiny bit and go a second time. And then the magnet should just drop in there like so. And you've got a nice little magnetic pull that's completely invisible. Just put a bit of tape on the face of the door to stop the magnet marking the wood. And what I do for a start is just put either PU glue or a bit of super glue on that front face, spray the magnet with the activator and drop it into the, the glue and centralize it on your mark. I tend to just wobble it around a little bit to make sure that the glue gets all over the sort of bottom of the hole because that again gives the, the piece of wood here some support so it's glued on the face and all around the underside of the magnet with that well of glue. And then once you got to that stage, I use two pack filler and just completely fill either side of the magnet and all over the top and just sand that flush. Like I was saying earlier, this magnet here wants to then attract to the one that sits over here. So. I'll take that magnet that's set there and I'll, I'll twist it round so when it's in this position they magnetise together and then I need to just check when I'm putting the ones in the frame on the doorstop that they do attract to each other because if you set that magnet the wrong way around it actually works as a push so you can't get them to sit in line with each other because of the polarity of the magnet.
So this is the stop bar for the doors. I've transferred the magnet positions to this. I'm drilling in from the outside because the architrave will actually cover the drill holes then. I've just set the pillar drill so that it doesn't go through the piece of wood. It leaves about one mil of timber on the bottom. And excuse the cutter, I am more than definitely overdue a new force of it. So then if I sit this in the right position, they should line up, put the magnet in like that. There's a nice pull on that to hold the door shut. Just had to take a little arris off this corner because obviously the radius from this pin when it slides in a track against that stop. I've just got to take that amount off the corner at the height of the stop here. There we go, that looks good. One thing I might just change if I did that again is this stop piece. I'd run it through and house it out the upright. I think that would just make it a bit stronger. Just as I cut through it, did my first cut there in the housing on that stop, I thought. Uh, that would have been a good idea, and then that piece would literally be supported through by the upright as well, but it's pretty strong, and there's obviously the architrave going to back that as well. So where these bits of filler are as well will be covered, obviously, by the architrave, and that will just look like the inside of the lining, so it's effectively going to double the thickness of that stop to about 18 mil anyway, so it should be plenty strong enough. Then magnets just give it a nice sort of it stops it from giving it any free play backwards. They just just hold it nicely against the stop. It's not a nasty click sound. It's not hard to open, but it's just enough to get it to shut and stay back against the stop. I've got to mold the windowboard section of the lining. So I've got this cutter here that I used last time I did some windowboards here, and I've got to put it in this profile block and then just tilt that back until it gets to the right angle. This is actually an architrave, like an OG architrave cutter. It just, just does this cut about perfectly. In the right place there. Like I said at the start of this, yeah, it's gonna be a fairly tricky cut on them ends. 
I did not make life easy for myself. Right, so this is pretty dangerous, but plan of attack to get this to mould. I can't use like a, a through fence because it's moulding the whole piece. I suppose you could do two through fences and offset this one in the middle. But because you're moulding the whole piece away, it won't be supported throughout the cut in the middle. So, and that's such a narrow piece, I, I think it'll dip in anyway. So what I'm going to do is use this 70mm bit, which is the cut on the end of there, and just use that to back it against the fence so it sort of holds this piece in a set depth and I'll back it with a square piece of timber here to protect the breakout on the back of the cut. Right, time to get everything sanded up and then I'll get it into the spray booth and start putting a couple of coats of paint on all the painted parts. Given these pieces three coats of paint, and I've sanded it back against the light so that I've got an absolutely perfectly finished surface on all the inside edges. I'm just going to glue it together and screw it for the final time. When I got to site, I leveled the base on which the window board sits on. There was a small lip of plaster that wasn't level, so I removed this with the multi-tool and then dry fitted the lining in place and locked it with an air wedge. Once that was level, I scribed the sill overhang back to the wall for a perfect fit where that sits against the wall. I'd allowed 5mm for the scribe in the workshop and it was just enough. Once the frame was level, I drilled for the fixings. I'm using 100mm concrete screws to hold the frame in place, and they're fixed behind at the hinge locations. These require a 6 or a 6.5mm hole, depending on what type of brick or block you're screwing into. And there's a couple of benefits to fixing at the hinge location. One is that it hides where the fixing is, so once the hinge is in place you don't see it. But it also makes the hinge point the strong point of the window, so there's no movement where the hinges attach.
It's always pretty exciting trying the door for the first time after fixing the frame. I fix all the leaves using just normal screws because they're easy to start and use while you're freehanding and holding a door in place. And then when all the work is done and I'm about to finish the job, I'll swap their normal screws for the finished screws, which in this case are some aged brass slot head countersunk screws. You briefly saw me there using an off cut to measure the length for the cut between the walls. The process for getting an accurate cut between them two walls involves putting a known cut on that off cut and then measuring the length of it. So I can make that off cut fit the brickwork nicely. So I know a square cut on that off cut fits nicely against the bricks and then can mark the other end of it and add that onto my piece of timber. And then I know I've got an exact length piece that will fit between them bricks nicely. You obviously need to do this for both ends because when you're cutting between two walls you get one chance of it fitting correctly you can't add a bit more wood on using this method with a small off cut just eliminates any guesswork then i very carefully marked the scribes for the brickwork and cut them out on the newly modified carvex if you've not seen that video then have a look on the channel for a video about the carvex fix if you own a carvex and haven't seen that video yet then i highly recommend you go and check it out there's a fix for the wobbly blade issue that makes it a completely different tool to use for doing the scribes i also borrowed a friend's coping foot to give it a trial run and it's definitely on my shopping list now i've linked it in the description box and i've called it jigsaw attachment I'm pretty happy with how that scribe turned out. Now just to repeat it on the other three sides. The curved top piece I've always called a turning piece, but I'm not sure if that's actually the correct term for it. So I don't know if anyone else has got a term they use for the, the curved piece that you scribe in above a window. Maybe drop a comment below if you have. The joints at the corners have a little notched mitre on them because of the bead detail, but I didn't manage to film that very well. I'm using MS Polymer Adhesive to glue the pieces in place. It's a really strong adhesive that doesn't foam or shrink, so it's perfect for an application like this. And it's also paintable. In between the strips and the brickwork, I'm using expanding foam just to fill any voids, and then fixing the scribes in place with an 18 gauge brad nail, just to secure them and hold them while the glue dries. These pinholes are filled later on and then painted.
Here I'm adding the architrave to the opposite side of the frame. I'm using a 23 gauge pinner to attach them, which I've only just learned how to use properly. Pulling the trigger and not releasing it means that you insert the nail without denting the workpiece, which I've really struggled with this pin gun. Previously, whenever I've used a pin gun, you sort of fire and then release the trigger all in one operation. And it's the release of the air and the trigger that causes the gun to bounce and it dents the wood very slightly. So my friend was using it and he discovered that if you just pulled the trigger and held onto it and then removed it from the workpiece before releasing it, it didn't actually make any indent at all. It's almost invisible. So he's called WOM. So now it's got a label on the side of the pinner called Don't Forget to WOM It. Got them fitting nicely, I'm now back in the workshop. So I've been through with the customer and we've just decided what bits we're going to repair and what bits are going to be kept and sanded and waxed over to keep a bit of the character of the, of the shutters. So I'm just going to quickly do the repairs on it and then age some of the brass down afterwards. Just going to age these hinges down, just basically remove the lacquer and then put them into an uh, aging solution. Once I've finished tumbling the hinges, you're better off with like a pea gravel or a tumbling media, but I've not got any at the minute. Just give them a very light rub back, almost like you, you know, you would be if you're restoring an original hinge, you're not taking that effect off, but just getting rid of that dull sort of top layer, because the aging solution tends to leave it quite dull. And just give it a dry off there. I'm giving them a rinse in water to clean them off. You end up with sort of a nice aged brass effect. You just lost that really sort of nasty polished brass colour. And you've got like that dull sort of timeless colour back to the brass. What we started with, that's where we've ended up.
As I mentioned before, now everything's looking good and I'm not going to make any more alterations, I'm going to install the finished screws. Okie dokie, so there we have a finished set of old new shutters. So I'll give you a little bit of a guided tour now that they've finished. The room here is still a bit of a construction site, but the shutters are at least finished. So we've obviously got the antique hardware, so these are the polished hinges aged down, and I've aged some screws, some brass screws down to match as well. We've got some lovely looking original hinges. We've got the brass section top and bottom. The shutter's actually been painted now so they are pretty much fully finished and uh, then pins slide in that brass track. It's pretty nice and smooth. It's got a nice sort of solid sound to it to be honest. So you just see the little knuckle of the hinge there when it's in the closed position. And then obviously when it's open you can see that much of the hinge. I'll go around the other side in a minute. Not got them yet but the customer's on about having some bolts so a little like slide bolt here on each shutter so that the shutters can be uh, locked and bolted and then you could perhaps put something on the windowsill. You would then have to come around to this side of the set of shutters to unbolt them to be able to open them and then you would see that there was stuff on there so there was no risk of, of knocking anything off if you were happen to stack something on there and then someone from the other side of the room were to come in and open a shutter's head knock the stuff off so that might be a small addition so that will be a antique brass bolt to go on there yeah the magnets work really really well so that last little pull right at the end there like I just uh, push a little bit of pressure. It's really got it. It's, it's, there's no rattle or spring back. It's just the perfect amount of pull there. Got a tiny little discrepancy in the fit. So this set of shutters could probably do with, I think the bottom hinge maybe packing out like half a mil just to cast it up a tiny, tiny bit. There's a little bit of a twist in the shutters which makes it look worse as you drop the camera angle down. There's nothing really, and I'm just gonna see how they settle. 
as they get used and stuff because you might might see the other one settle a little bit and then need to adjust that so I'll see how they how they work in I'm gonna be on site for quite some time so we can uh, always make an adjustment but yeah customers really pleased they wanted the shutters to sit within the thickness of the wall they pretty much do there's just a little poke uh, it's about 10 mil so you can't really crumble for that but they just look they sit really nicely there they're perfect lovely see my idea with the track was to stop it so that you didn't see the end of the track that would never ever get cleaned and always look dirty so yeah the end of the track there just stops underneath the door which is quite nice and i did have to take a little notch out the back corner of this door just for the way like it slides it obviously pivots around on that rebate just had to remove like a little nibble out the back there you don't really see it even when it's open like that it's not something that really catches your eye or anything but it needed that removing for it to be able to work it's still a work in progress this side of the shutters the kitchen is more finished than the rest of the house that's how the hinges look when it's in the open position and then when we shut see how that uh, top rail works so we've got a bit of a rebate there that stops the shutters so that when they come back they sit nicely against the rebate and the same on this side you've got a lovely finish just looks seamless around from this side just your, your standard shutter sort of daylight gaps that you get with shutters so when they're in the closed position you'd think that was a, an outside window and the sill here it's got quite a nice nice fluted detail to it it's like the original one from the house so we've copied that from upstairs just needs a final bit of decoration a little bit of painting a bespoke cutter for the architraves here the outside piece there so that width piece there was the original one from upstairs and we've added another one of these beads on to like a 10 mil flat to make it a bit grander for downstairs so we've got a 70 mil architrave downstairs and i think it's 44 mil there for the upstairs one yeah looking good hope you enjoyed watching this one if you got this far just hit the like button and uh, leave a comment if you've got a question I'll, I'll get back to you thanks very much see you next time